All right, we're going to get quickly to the end of this particular part of our lesson where we're really in a pretty prolonged study of how things go wrong at the beginning uh, in the Garden of Eden, how God is continuing to work to bring them back to that perfection, which will one day happen at the return of Jesus. And we're looking right now, hopefully I think we'll try to finish up today, uh, how Jesus has brought about a new community, that the estrangement and the dysfunction that was caused in human relationships in the garden uh, begins to be overcome even here and now in the development of a new community in Christ where we have the forgiveness of sins, the reception of the Holy Spirit to help us live out this community, and um, and this is a, something that comes together uh, immediately in the preaching of the gospel in the book of Acts. And then we've, we've gone through all of these passages in the New Testament that talk about the nature of this community, that there is neither Jew nor Greek, slave nor free, that all of the dividing walls have been brought down, that that Christ has brought Jew and Gentile together in one new man, and that this unity, uh, in Ephesians 3, this unity is the way that the heavenly realms became aware of what God's <laughs> eternal purpose is, and that is to unite everything uh, under heaven, uh, in heaven and on earth, everything in Christ Jesus. This is something that even the, the angelic beings and the heavenly realms that serve God did not really fully comprehend until God brings the church together, and, and they see that. And so we, we've, we've talked about this new community that to a certain degree now we enjoy the, the kind of relationships that we will, I mean, to leave just even be better when sin is out of the way, won't it? But in the meantime, we are committed to a life, a community where we love one another, where we care for one another, where by the grace of God we begin to experience a community life of that that harkens back to what God had for us at, in Eden and will one day be ours in perfection. We've talked about the importance of maintaining the unity of the spirit. That This is something God has created, so we must do our best to maintain it. That we're members of one another, and so we have responsibilities in this community to care for one another. We have the mind of Christ uh, that Jesus put that our needs ahead of his to the point of death on the cross and Paul calls for us to put the needs of our brothers and sisters ahead of our own with that same kind of sacrificial love that we might that we might say that we might be of one mind and one heart and, and the one body of Christ and then finally in Colossians 3 we left off last week how uh, we are put off the old self and put on the new self which is renewed in the in knowledge after the image of our creator that in this new community we are being shaped into the image of our creator so that once again paul says there's neither jew nor greek circumcised or uncircumcised barbarian scythian slave free but christ is all and in all and so there's that new community that that we uh, that we're a part of which is now only possible for us to maintain by god's help by the forgiveness that we have and by the spirit who, who dwells within us. And then I, I ask you to look at some scriptures here that we're going to talk about uh, today as kind of a kind of a postscript. Something that struck me when I was reading all of these other passages about, uh, about the community that we have in Christ. That obviously the New Testament uh, says a lot about unity and about maintaining unity but then as we read through the unfolding story of the church in the book of Acts, and we read uh, some of the letters in the New Testament, we, we come across times when the unity of the church was at risk. And when extreme efforts are made to, uh, to address that issue. When you think about... Let's just start with the book of Acts, and then we'll just take some random ideas out of, uh, out of some of the letters. Uh, just kind of, this is just kind of like off the top of our heads, I realize, but, but can you think of times in the book of Acts when the church was threatened with division? Yeah, there are Judaizing teachers that come along in the book of Acts. And um, we, 
And of course, then we have we have letters that correspond to that as well, where we see that activity. We have there are teachers that come along in the early church who are uh, we, we refer to them as Judaizers. I think that's the term in Scripture that they're wanting to impose uh, various aspects of the law of Moses on Gentile believers. It's typically circumcision. I mean, that's usually the beginning point. Um, and and there's uh, and the, the big pushback of that. What's the, uh, how does the church in the book of Acts? How does the church deal with that? How does the church deal with the threat of bringing Gentiles under Jewish law? How does the church address that concern and provide a solution for the church that leads it to unity? Paul rebukes Peter and <clears throat> publicly and, and put it into that. Okay. And so we, and we have a couple of different things going on here. And we'll, we'll get, we'll, uh, uh, Dale mentions the Paul's public rebuke of Peter, and, just, and we'll talk about that in just a minute. In the book of Acts, it's Acts chapter 15, the big Jerusalem council. Everybody comes, and they come because of the kind of thing that Dale just talked about. But everybody comes in, in uh, Acts chapter 15, big council. What are we going to do about this? Well, they need to keep the law. Well, what do you think? And people get up and talk. Um, uh, Paul and Barnabas address the crowd. Simon Peter addresses the crowd. Uh, eventually, James, the brother of Jesus, who is a, a, a renowned leader among the Jewish believers in Jerusalem, he kind of throws out the consensus, uh, and a letter is written that is sent out to all of the churches to tell them that Gentiles do not are not under the law of Moses. So you see how the church deals with this. This is a big threat. The, actual, the first thread in the book of Acts is Acts chapter 6, where you have the problem with the distribution of the food. And uh, the, the Hellenistic believers versus the Hebraic, the, the widow groups, and there's, there is either, there is either, you know, there is either the perception of unfairness or the reality of unfairness in the way these people are being treated, but whatever, whether it's perceived or true, action is taken immediately with the appointment of seven men who, guess what, happen to have Greek names, which tells us that if the Hellenists are having a problem with getting served, let's put the Hellenists in charge of the food program. And we'll make sure that this doesn't happen. You see how things are done in very, very practical ways to avoid division. Uh, and, and of course part of that is just because division is a bad thing in, in any organization or organism. But in the church it's especially bad because the whole premise of the church is becoming one in Christ. And if that doesn't happen then you know the whole purpose uh, has, fell, has fallen through. And so you have those, uh, those Judaizers in Acts 10 and 11. You have the conference in, in chapter 15. And then in the letters uh, <coughs> Dale's mentioned Galatians, where Paul brings this issue up and had to dress down Peter publicly because Peter wouldn't eat with the Gentiles and so forth. What about Corinth? Does Corinth have any trouble with division? <clears throat> there should have just been a roar of laughter with that question. <laughs> yeah, just a tad. It's like, let me... Was there anything that they... <laughs> this is a church that has... That is just through and through, with issues that are coming up. And, and part of it is they have this worldly thinking going on about it, wise like the Greeks. And I mean, they're, they're divided over their teachers. But a part of their division gets back to Jew-Gentile roots and, and things, meat sacrifice to idols and things like that. And Paul writes about this extensively. Uh, in Romans, Paul takes a couple of chapters to write about matters of conscience because these are things that uh, that can uh, that can divide the church. Romans nine through eleven talks to the Gentiles about hey, don't get haughty because now you're and that's H A U G H T Y, not H O T T Y. Uh, just in case you're wondering, <laughs> but don't get haughty about you're included in the in this olive tr tree now because uh, you don't really belong here. You were grafted in because you believed in Jesus, and and the Jews are still the root because see Gentiles. It can go both ways. 
Jews can look at Gentiles and say, you don't really belong. And Gentiles back then could say, oh, yeah, but you didn't even believe in your Messiah, and now we're the in crowd. So there's all this going on. And, and so I just bring, just bring all that up to say this new community thing, <laughs> it's hard. <laughs> it's really difficult. Not every letter addresses these issues, but these issues pop up everywhere, hence the one another passages. And so something struck me um, in, re in reflecting on this that I just wanted to, uh, to bring up. And I mentioned it last week uh, because Paul just sets out on this mission that he... It is so important to him that not only does he write about it a lot, but in order to carry it out, he's willing, seriously, to die. And that sounds pretty extreme. That's pretty extreme. And that is with the Gentiles, the Gentile believers, making contribution to the poor Judean saints. Paul conducts two fundraising campaigns uh, in Scripture. Um, <clears throat> The first one is in Acts chapter 11, um, verse 27, and um, and uh, this is where Barnabas has gotten Saul, Paul, to come to Antioch, and the Gentile church is kind of thriving in Antioch. You know, this is a, kind of the first major Gentile outpost of the faith. Uh, verse 27, now in those days prophets came down from Jerusalem to Antioch, and one of them named Agabus stood up and foretold by the Spirit that there would be a great famine over all the world. This took place in the days of Claudius. So the disciples determined everyone according to his ability to send relief to the brothers living in Judea. And they did so, sending it to the elders by the hand of Barnabas and Saul. It's interesting that the famine appears, appears to be a widespread famine, and yet the, the first response of the Gentile church in Antioch is to take up relief and take it to the Jewish church in Jerusalem. And they were just told, it's just, that's just the facts. We're just, we're just told. This may be what Paul has in mind when in Galatians chapter 2, When he's, uh, <laughs> this is about him being accepted to go to the Gentiles and so forth. When James and Cephas and John, who seemed to be pillars, perceived the grace that was given to me, they gave the right hand of fellowship to Barnabas and me that we should go to the Gentiles and they to the circumcised. Only they ask us to remember the poor, the very thing I was eager to do. Paul has done this. He's shown his eagerness to help the poor in this contribution coming from Gentile church uh, the, to, uh, to the churches uh, of Judea. Now, the second of these efforts occurs during Paul's uh, third missionary journey, and we're very, very familiar with this one. Uh, I dare say that uh, often, often on, on Sundays, we read passages uh, before our, our contribution is taken up that relates specifically to this, to this uh, special contribution. Uh, in 1 Corinthians chapter 16, Paul says, Now concerning the collection for the saints, as I directed to the churches of Galatia, so also are you to do. On the first day of every week, each of you is to put something aside and store it up as he may prosper, so that there will be no collecting when I come. And when I arrive, I will send those whom you accredit by letter to carry your gift to Jerusalem. If it seems advisable that I should go also, they will accompany me. So what's this contribution? Where's this contribution going to? What's it for? I mean, at least the, the location. Where's it headed? Jerusalem. Jerusalem. <coughs> okay. Corinth is in Achaia. What other churches have received this, the, the, this same kind of arrangement? Churches of Galatia. We're going to find out when we get to 2 Corinthians that so have the churches in Macedonia. 
Well, Macedonia and Achaia are largely Gentile places. They're, I mean, modern-day Greece. Uh, Asia, uh, you know, there would be a mixture. But we know of Paul's missionary journeys in Asia, there were a whole lot more Gentiles coming to faith than Jews. And so we see that there's this effort going forward, and Paul's coming through. And notice how formal this is. He, he wants representatives to go with him from the church in Corinth. He wants them to be introduced by letter from the church as their representative and to take the money to physically take this uh, to Jerusalem. It's, it's a, it, you see how formalized this is. They're going to be representatives from the church. They're going to have letters of introduction. Uh, and so um, just think about that. And then, of course, then we have two full chapters. We won't, we won't read these two chapters, but I dare say most of us are really familiar with these two chapters because we've, we've read portions of it off and on in, in our assemblies and, and, of course, just in general reading through uh, the scripture. Here are verses 1 through 7. Here. I'll, I'll read a little bit of this. We want you to know, brothers, about the grace of God that has been given among the churches of Macedonia for in a severe test of affliction, their abundance of joy and their extreme poverty have overflowed in a wealth of generosity on their part. For they gave according to their means, as I can testify, and beyond their means of their own accord, begging us earnestly for the favor of taking part in the relief of the saints. And this not as we expected, but they gave themselves first to the Lord, and then by the will of God to us. Accordingly, we urge Titus that as he had started, so he should complete among you this act of grace. But as you excel in everything, in speech, in faith, in knowledge, and in all earnestness, and in our love for you, see that you excel in this act of grace also. And you may already be familiar with, with what follows in this text. Can you read between the lines here and see what Paul's saying and what he's getting at? Just from what we've just read, how do you think the collection's going? Do you get an idea that it's going well or that maybe it's not going so well? Or maybe you don't, maybe you don't have any, maybe there's not a clue that pops up to you. Why is he bringing up the Macedonians? They were begging to take part in it. Yeah, and why would you, why would you do that? Why not just say, hey, yeah, we're going to be there, so if you have it already, we'll be picking it up. Why the example of the earnestness of the Macedonians and what an act of faith? I would just say because the Corinthians are struggling to follow through, and I, I think that becomes I think that becomes clear as you as you work through uh, you work through the text. I'm not going to say Paul is using flattery here because that flattery is a can have a negative connotation. But look at verse seven. But as you excel in everything, in faith, in speech, in knowledge, in all earnestness. And in our love for you, see that you excel in this act of grace also. Have you read the Corinthian letters? Do you, do you see what I'm getting at? Do you see? They're puffed up with knowledge. That be, Paul is just, he's reaching out here to the very best that he can hope to find within them. To say, yeah, in a sense, you probably see yourselves excelling here, excel in this. This is something you need to excel in. And... Um, and so he tells about the generosity of the Macedonian churches. Uh, take, a look at, take a look at verse 8. I say this not as a command, but to prove by the earnestness of others your love also as genuine. Look at verse 10. And in this matter I give my judgment. This benefits you, who a year ago started not only to do this work, but also desire to do it. So now finish doing it as well so that your readiness in desiring it may be matched by your completing it out of what you have. For if the readiness is there, it is acceptable according to what a, man, a person has and not according to what he does not have. How does it sound to you they're doing? It sounds to me like they started and they haven't followed through. Do you, you get that out of this text? It's like, you, yeah, at first you seem to really have a desire, but now... You know, uh, this is something uh, you really need to put some effort for. Uh, verse 24, so give proof before the churches of your love and of our boasting about you to these men. And then 
he talks about the churches of Macedonia again. And notice verse 3 of chapter 9. But I am sending the brothers so that our boasting about you may not prove empty in this matter. So what, what's Paul been saying about these folks? These guys are going to help. They're going to come through. They're, they're in. I'm sending the brothers so that our boasting about you may not prove empty in this matter, so that you may be ready as I said you would be. Otherwise, if some Macedonians come with me and find that you are not ready, we would be humiliated to say nothing of you for being so confident. So I thought it necessary to urge the brothers to go on ahead to you and arrange in advance for the gift you have promised so that it may be ready as a willing gift, not as an exaction. So Paul is not confident that he's going to show up and, it's, and the contribution is going to be collected. So he sends people ahead of him because he knows if they get there, if he comes from Macedonia with the Macedonian representatives and he gets to Corinth and they haven't even done this, Paul says, well, number one, I'm going to be humiliated because I've been saying how, how much you want to help. And what about you? you know, aren't you going to be humiliated? So I'm sending these brothers to make sure uh, that, this, um, you know, that this happens. And finally then, you know, all of this about don't do it grudgingly, God loves a cheerful giver, all of these verses, they're, they're out of this context. I would say they're, out, they're in a context of a church who has lost the desire to sacrificially give. And Paul is urging them on because he's made commitments and they made commitments to him. And uh, if you read through these two chapters, I think, I think that flavor comes through. I don't think I'm jumping to you know, conclusions that, to, like, to mar their reputation. I think they've, they've kind of like lost their way here. And Paul's, man, this is, this is going to blow up in my face. And, and, I, and we're going to see that this isn't just about Paul being humiliated. Uh, finishing out this in, in chapter, uh, verse 12 of chapter 9. For the ministry of this service is not only supplying the needs of the saints, but is also overflowing in many thanksgivings to God. By their approval of this service, they will glorify God because of your submission that comes from your confession of the gospel of Christ and the generosity of your contribution for them and for all others. While they long for you and pray for you because of the surpassing grace of God upon you, thanks be to God for his, inexpre his inexpressible gift. Now, who is this money going to? Who's going to benefit from it? The folks in Jerusalem, the church in Jerusalem, um, uh, the Judean Christians. So when he says, it's not only supplying the needs of the saints, but is overflowing in many thanksgivings to God. By their approval, he's talking about the recipients here. By their approval of this service, they will glorify God because of your submission that comes from your confession of the gospel of Christ and the generosity of your contribution for them and for all others. So what does Paul anticipate will be the Jewish reaction? What is he hoping to see the Jewish brothers do when they receive these funds? They'll be happy. They'll be happy. Absolutely. And what will their thoughts be toward their Gentile counterparts in the church? They will love them. They'll glorify God because of them. They'll glorify God because, no, notice the, the, the language here. Because of your submission that comes from your confession of the gospel of Christ. Do you see how this isn't just, you know, let's send a few bucks to Jerusalem. This gift is coming as a connection to their submission to and confession of the gospel. It, it, what, I, what I want us to see, and it'll become really clear when we look at one more passage here, this isn't just about giving people money who are in need. This is Paul's effort. But 
Paul's effort to maintain unity between Gentile and Jew in the church, for the Gentiles to bless the Jews, for the Jews, in this case, to recognize their Gentile brothers, is like, well, I guess they really are. I guess they really have confessed the gospel. Look at their love for us. Look at how they're expressing this. This is, this is at the heart of Paul's concern. This, this is, Paul is concerned with those in need, but this is, there's a different level. There's another level going on here. This isn't just taking care of the poor in general. This is about Gentiles taking care of Jewish people who are poor. And do you see, going back into the first century, with all of the dangers that would divide fellowship between Jew and Gentile in Christ, how Paul could see this as being so very important. And so he just kind of explains it all in Romans. See, these things are, these letters are kind of happening around the same time frame. Um, when we study letters, often we don't study them together like this. But when Paul's writing uh, this church to the church at Rome, this whole thing's going on. Uh, he's right in the middle of this whole contribution thing and traveling and picking up the money. And so uh, when he addresses the church in Romans chapter uh, 15, uh, verse 25, <clears throat> um, you know, he talks about, hey, I want to come there. I want to go to Spain. I hope you guys can help me out. You know, give a little contribution toward that work. But then notice what he says in verse 25. At present, however... I'm going to Jerusalem, bringing aid to the saints. For Macedonia and Achaia, have, that's okay, Achaia, is, that's Corinth, uh, Macedonia, that's Thessalonica, Philippi, Berea, those, those churches. But again, the very people he's been referencing in 2 Corinthians 8 and 9. For Macedonia and Achaia have been pleased to make some contribution for the poor among the saints at Jerusalem. For they were pleased to do it. At least some of them were. <laughs> and indeed, they owe it to them. Okay, there it is. They owe it to them. For if the Gentiles have come to share in their spiritual blessings, they ought also to be of service to them in material blessings. You see Paul's reasoning here. The Gentiles are, have stepped into this amazing grace of God by virtue of God's plan to save the world through Israel. The Gentiles need to understand this relationship and be very appreciative of their Jewish brothers and long to be of service to them in a material way like the Jews have been of spiritual service to them. And so he says... When therefore I've completed this and have delivered to them what has been collected, I will leave for Spain by way of you. I know that when I come to you, I'll, be, I'll come in fullness and in blessing and Christ. I appeal to you, brothers, by our Lord Jesus Christ and by the love of the Spirit to strive together with me in your prayers to God on my behalf that I may be delivered from the unbelievers in Judea and that my service for Jerusalem may be acceptable to the saints." Notice the two things he prays for. He knows things are going to go rough on him with the unbelieving Jews. He knows that's going to happen. But he also prays that he might be acceptable to the saints. The saints there are the Jewish Christians to whom he is bringing aid from the Gentile churches. So that by God's will I may come to you with joy and be refreshed in your company. May the God of peace be with you all. Amen. So Paul is essentially here giving the rationale. Uh, for this gift, and he recognizes the dangers uh, that he faces. And now going back to the book of Acts, I hope you'll find there's a payoff here that's worth all this time. Because <laughs> this, isn't, this isn't just about the history of this. I, there's, to me, there's, there's a big payoff, and uh, that's why we need to finish today, because we have to get to the payoff. Um, I mean, I can't leave you. Next Sunday, we're not having class. We're, we'll be in together in the auditorium. It's like, we need a, this all needs to fit together as, as one time. In, in our last class, we talked a lot about Acts 21 and 22 with the Apostle Paul in Jerusalem. So let me hit the high points. 
As Paul travels to Jerusalem, he's warned on multiple occasions that he's going to run into trouble when he gets there. Even as prophets come from Jerusalem and tell him. And what does he say? I'm ready to die at Jerusalem. Why is he going to Jerusalem? I'm not saying it's the main thing. But what is one of the reasons that Paul is going to Jerusalem? He's carrying this money. He's taking these gifts. This is the return gift. All these people from Macedonia, all these people from Achaia, all these folks with letters, they're all coming back. And in the book of Acts, it doesn't mention them specifically, but that's what this trip is all about. Paul is not going to get this close and not finish this work. And so he says, you know, I'm ready to, I'm ready to die uh, if, if that's what it takes. And it, So in chapter 21 of the book of Acts, that, and there are a couple of times you know, where, where this happens, and, uh, and, and he just comes out and, and says it. You know, they're crying for him. They tie him up with his own belt, and it says, you know, what are you doing, leaping and breaking my heart? I'm ready not only to be imprisoned, but even to die in Jerusalem for the name of Jesus. And so they, they say, okay, forget it. We'll back off. We've, you know, the Spirit has made known to him what's going to happen, and he's going anyway. And he's not going only for this gift to be made. He's going to also address the issue of the Jews who, are, who, who have issues with him. But that's part of it. And it's amazing to me that he doesn't oh, just go ahead and, you know, we'll Venmo the money, right? We'll just, we'll just we'll find another, let's just have somebody else carry it in. And then in, in the last part of the chapter, he meets with James, and he delivers the contribution. The contribution is not mentioned in, in Acts. But this is a part of what's going on. We know that from the other, Luke's just not talking about that, but we know from the letters that that's what's going on here. And then remember, James says, you know, we got these Jewish believers who are, there's so many of them now, but they think, they, all they hear is you're telling the Gentiles, they don't, you know, that the law of Moses doesn't matter. You know, you don't have to keep, you know, even Jews don't need to worry about these things. You remember the whole, the, the, the scenario they come up with. Here, these guys need to, are taking a vow. Why don't you go? Take them to the temple. You know, pay for them. You know, Paul does that. He does everything uh, that they want him to do. And then, of course, he's falsely accused of bringing Gentiles into the, church, into the temple, which he did not do. That's when the big melee breaks out of the temple. He's arrested. There we go. Okay, that's the, that's the big thing going on in Jerusalem. Why is Paul so driven about this. We hear these concepts like through the church the manifold wisdom of God is now made known to the angels and the principalities in the heavenly places. It's like, okay, that's a pretty lofty thought. I mean, how does that help me when I'm driving down the interstate, you know, I mean, how does that how does that impact my life? This is so lofty and abstract. What I want us to see is that the unity of the church, and particularly in a, from a first century point of view between Jew and Gentile, is so important. Because if the unity between Jew and Gentile fails, the whole purpose of the gospel is undermined. The very thing that God has been trying to do since day one, when people were divided by sin, will be, it'll be, we will not have experienced it in Christ. And, and that eternal purpose of God will to some degree be thwarted. And what I want to point out to us is that this principle that seems so lofty and like, why would I ever call that to mind? It's as practical is writing a contribution check. It's as practical as making a gift that's being taken to Jerusalem. This, these lofty principles are worked out in our lives. Three chapters. Three chapters in the New Testament on this contribution. plus the explanation in Romans 15. It's just an offering to the poor. Why do we have 2 Corinthians 8 and 9 and 1 Corinthians 16 and Romans 15? Why all this attention to what would just appear like, yeah, those people, they were in a hurricane, let's send them some money. 
Okay, that's good and that's, that's great. But why, so, do you see what I'm getting at? Why, do you realize that essentially everything we know about the contribution, that all the, all the passages that we use to talk about contribution are written in an effort to maintain the unity between Jew and Gentile, and Gentiles helping the poor saints in Jerusalem. What, what I'm getting at is, there's the takeaway to me. This principle is down to the nuts and bolts of life. It gets down to, the, to things like, will you send, will you make a gift, Corinth, to your Jewish brothers in Judea? Do you buy into the gospel enough to do that? Do you see the unity? And so when, when we take that to ourselves, it reminds us that this is a principle that comes down to every level. Might I say that this principle comes down to the relationship I have with my wife as a sister in Christ. If we are estranged, if we are divided, how do we as members of the body of Christ reflect God's eternal purpose? It, it impacts every relationship that we have with one another. If we don't love one another, if we don't care, all of these things, they all, all of this directs to God's eternal purpose. That's what I want us to see. These are not small, insignificant things that are just like of a practical nature. Well, it's better to get along. It's better to give people the benefit of the doubt. No. The eternal purpose of God is at stake in the church. And that's why Paul says you better be eager to maintain the unity of the Spirit in the bond of peace. As far as it is possible with you, be at peace with everyone. <laughs> The, the, that's why we, we read these, uh, because God is working to reconcile a community, and it all ends. And when I say the word revelation, and you're so glad it's only 944, you know we've got to be out of here in a minute. I'm not going to go off the deep end, but I love this text. I'm going to scoot over to read it. I'm not even going to set the context. You'll get the point. After this I looked, and there before me was a great multitude that no one could count, from every nation, tribe, people, and language, standing before the throne and in front of the Lamb. They were wearing white robes and were holding palm branches in their hands, and they cried out in a loud voice, Salvation belongs to our God who sits on the throne and to the Lamb. Everyone. Everyone. Every nation, every tribe, every people, every language, every political party, every ethnic group, everyone. Everyone united in Christ. <clears throat> That's the eternal reality. And what is incumbent upon us right now is to the best of our ability, live out what God has made possible even now. To live out to the best degree we can in a broken and fallen world where we all make mistakes and we can all get our feelings hurt or we can all have schisms at times, but to make every effort we can to understand how vital the unity of the, the, the body of Christ is. And uh, I would remind you <clears throat> in very brief words, that last image in Revelation 21 and 22 of the Holy City, New Jerusalem coming down, it's the bride of Christ, it's the perfect cube, it's the holy of holies. It's built on the foundation of the apostles, the gates of the <coughs> tribes of Israel. And when you get inside this perfect cube, you dwell with God. You dwell in fellowship with God. You're, you're, you're in his presence in the most holy place. That's where God's taking us. He's taking us to a complete community that's been reconciled and redeemed by the blood of Christ. So in the here and now, Let's do our best to live it out. This, it's so important. It is, it is critical to the credibility of the gospel of Christ. It truly is. And how, what a difference that makes when we think of it that way. And we'll move on next class for this new community to our future, to the future impact of what Christ has done and speak about kind of where we started, the importance of bodily resurrection. Just thank you all so much.